Okay, good. So let's start our lecture about the numerical simulation in metal forming. Uh, last week we talked about some aspects of the numerical simulation. I can say that the we are talking about the methods and their terminologies in numerical simulation in metal forming. Last week we introduced what is FEM, what is simulation and why we use simulation and uh, these general things and a little bit we went in, into the mathematical methods we use, we use for solving the equations and uh, numerical methods we use and compare, we compared with analytical method. So today we continue on this topic uh, with the following content. Okay, so uh, last week we talked about the discretization, but on, on the geometry, not discretization of time. But this week we will talk about the discretization of time a, a little bit, and then uh, we talked about we talk about the adaptive meshing and uh, remeshing in simulation what is adaptive meshing what is remeshing and why we have to use the remeshing or adaptive meshing system and then uh, we go through the contact problems which is really important in numerical simulation how how you define the contacts and how you uh, manage your problem from this point of view and finally, a summary on these two uh, sessions because next week we will start a new topic which is about the uh, modeling of the uh, mathematical modeling of the flow, flow behavior of materials. Which that is also very important because it's, I can say, it's the most important input for uh, numerical simulation in metal forming. Okay. First, we talk about the non-linearities in uh, metal forming simulation and uh, what kind of non-linearity we have, and because it's it's the source, it's the, the base of the then the reason of. The, that we use the implicit or explicit uh, numerical simulation which in explicit and implicit are about the time discretization so first we st start from the base to understand that what's 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 the need of using this explicit and implicit methods so only with linear problem, the system of equation can be solved after specifying the boundary conditions. So we talked about this equation last week, but uh, in, in the form of linear problems, this k is not function of u, u is the displacement here. So I can say that the, here the stiffness matrix is a function of displacement or is a function of process. It means that when your process goes on, your stiffness matrix changes. So as a result, uh, the problem is, in this case, the problem is not linear or it's non-linear. But how this non-linearity uh, comes to our problem there, we have three kinds, three different kinds of non-linearity. The first one is geometrical non-linearities. In this type of non-linearity, the deformation is so huge, so the relation between K, the stiffness matrix, and the force we have applied is no long, it's not uh, linear. Okay, as an example, here you can see a simple tensile test 
and uh, you know at the beginning in the elastic region we can assume that uh, the material uh, the behavior the geometry is changing linear but when the necking happens in plastic area then geometrical nonlinearity appears it means that you know that for example even in analytical solution if you want to calculate the stress and strain the true stress and true strain you should calculate based on the uh, real cross section at, at that moment uh, we talked about it in fundamental of metal forming so if we want to simulate such a process here we will have the same problem so it's a kind of non-linearity in geometry uh, that happens here and we have another kind of non-linearity which is the non-linear property of material this is about the properties and for example again in elastic area you know that the uh, relation between the uh, stress and strain in elastic area is linear but after that for plastic deformation it will not be linear so uh, we will talk about it on next slide or another example of non-linearity is the changing the Coulomb friction this is a this is another kind of non-linearity uh, which is related to I can say which is related to the property of material so we will, again we will talk about this graph more later but these are two kinds of uh, friction models Coulomb models and then uh, constant shear models and uh, in some cases you should use the hybrid model and in the case of hybrid model in the case of hybrid model you can see the non-linearity here because yeah you can see that it's not linear it's, it will change in this way and uh, uh, even for the Coulomb friction uh, it's by itself it's a function of temperature strain and the applied force it's another kind of uh, another example of non-linearity under the material properties and uh, the last one is the structural non-linearities what does it mean the structural non-linearities it's again about the contact in our problem okay because you know if if you check this simulation you see that from the beginning to the end the contact condition is changing the contact surface is changing and uh, this brings non-linearity to the problem by itself so you cannot solve the problem based on the initial and the final uh, uh, state of deformation you have non-linearity and you should break it down uh, and discretize, discretize it, discretize it uh, not only in the space by meshing but also for time Okay, let's uh, review this uh, type, uh, the nonlinearity in a simple example, which is the uh, nonlinearity for a fixed beam. Okay, we have a beam here, and what at the, at the one head is it's fixed here, and it's a simple problem, a simple beam problem, and the F, this force is applied on the other head. So in the case that F is not too big and the deformation is small, as I said, we are in that, for example, elastic region. So we can, okay, the problem is, we can assume that the problem is linear and this, this is the equation we have to solve, which is not so complicated and we can handle it. In the case that we increase the force a little bit, which we call this uh, situation as the moderate deformation in moderate deformation still we have a linear problem however this stiffness value is changed this S value we call it the damping uh, 
the damping value which no, it is added to the stiffness and uh, it's because of the strain of or the deformation of the neutral fi uh, fiber in the middle but still it's not too big and we can assume it in, in linear form okay still it's okay we can solve it but in this case when the, the f the applied f becomes very big then the def and the deformation plastic deformation is so big like this then non-linearity comes to the problem in this way okay you have this applied f but now you have two components of f f prime and f second which okay f prime is applied is uh, causing a bending still the, the normal component but the uh, t tangential component this component uh, causes the lengthening it increases the length of the beam so this increasement of the length or which, which uh, will, uh, will lead to a kind of narrowing on the beam narrowing means the change of cross section and change of cross section means non-linearity in the problem okay for example even in a tensile test we talked about it so it's a kind of narrowing here and uh, uh, non-linearity comes to the problem here the same it happens here not not this this uh, this much strong and not this much localized but however with, when you have f second in this direction then you will have some lengthening and uh, uh, narrowing okay so this is a simple another simple example of nonlinearity in geometry of the problem. Okay, let's talk about the nonlinearity of material properties a little bit uh, deeper. As I said, if a tensile test is deformed beyond its elastic range then some permanent or plastic deformation appears that you know that if you remove the force deformation will remain and it, it does not disappear so in this case when you have the plastic deformation then the relation between the strain and uh, no it's the relation between the stress and the elongation is not correct is not uh, linear and it's it will be non-linear okay up to here it's we are in the elastic area but then in plastic area you can see the non-linearity of the behavior of uh, material so by increasing the elongation cross section of sample decreases it's a kind of after after necking here so this is a kind of geometrical nonlinearity however we have a kind of nonlinearity in the material property by itself as, as you can see here this is because of the strain hardening and so it's it it's not behaving a linear anymore and here it's it's a couple of hardening and necking which is a geometrical uh, non-linearity so here we have both geometrical and material properties non-linearity here we have just the material properties non-linearity and here the problem is linear anyway uh, this is an example of non-linearity of material properties which is a simple example of course we can see the non-linearity of the material properties in many other as aspects of the material properties many many material properties are time are temperature dependent and uh, when it's temperature dependent then we can say that it's time dependent because we have we have heat flux and cooling during the deformation 
So in many different aspects, uh, material nonlinearity comes to the problem from the material properties. And okay, this slide focus on the structural nonlinearity or the contact problems. We talked about it before. So situation of contact between the workpiece and tool are an elementary aspect of forming process. It's elementary, but it's, it's really important. We will talk about the contact, how to uh, uh, define the contact surfaces in your simulation today, later, in next slide. Because alternating the contact leads to an abrupt rise of mechanical and thermal boundary condition. Okay, you can see even, of course, in the case of mechanical, uh, changing the mechanical boundary condition, you can clearly see that, okay, when, when the metal forming process proceeds, the mechanical boundary condition changes at each step of time, time by time, and step by step. And even uh, it affects the thermal properties because when you apply the force, the, the contacts, uh, when you apply force uh, on, on a contact between the mm, die and the material, uh, you, this force not only affects the influence on the friction but also influence on the, uh, the rate of heat and the heat transfer between the die, between the workpiece and die so it it's this that uh, changing the thermal boundary condition brings again a nonlinearity to the problem so we can we can categorize the contact in our uh, metal forming problems into the three different categories as you can see here the first category is contact with the rigid tool okay for example in this figure or in this uh, animation you can see we assume the die upper die and lower die as a rigid body in this case uh, the tool will not will not change its geometry and temperature it means that it's rigid, so you have no deformation in dies, or I can say that you assume that you have no deformation in dies and no uh, temperature change. Yeah, maybe you say that it's not correct. Yes, you're right, it's not correct. But in many cases, uh, yeah, I, we talked about this. Uh, simplification in the uh, physical model when we want to uh, uh, create the uh, model, mathematical model, it's a kind of s simplification uh, that uh, we usually use uh, in metal forming uh, uh, simulations. Uh, just we, we cannot use this uh, kind of assumption when you need to obtain some special information on, on die or uh, when this kind of uh, assumption uh, result into uh, lo loss, lose of accuracy. But generally, we assume the die in the rigid. Uh, why we assume it rigid? Because it's really easier to handling and our numerical model, our model becomes smaller. You need much more much less time to solve the simulation to obtain the result however if you assume the contact with deformation tools it means that you have deformation in your tools so not only deformation but heat transfer everything like this this example you can see here this is the workpiece deforming and these are the dies and the die holder here you can see in this case you, sh you should have mesh on your workpiece uh, on your die and on all parts as you can see here 
So this, when you need uh, discretization on dies and workpiece together, you can see how much the number of elements increased compared to the case that you assume the die is just rigid so you have no elements and no calculation on, on the die and just to apply the condition using the boundary condition but when you have such a big model uh, with high number of elements then the, your calculation becomes complex so this is, this is the reason why we usually we do not use this kind of uh, contact contact with deformation tools but however as I said in, in some cases you need to do it uh, for solving some problems the other category of contact is self contact this is the example here you can see that during the deformation sometimes the free surfaces on the material or workpiece uh, sticks together in this way so we call it self-contact and uh, you should notice that if you have a self-contact at this in this situation when it's not there is no contact self-contact here you have not any force you don't have any force here no force applied but when you have self-contact then the boundary condition changes in your simulation so the, simula the simulator should consider this usually the simulator consider this problem automatically if you turn on the related option in your simulation so these are three kinds of contact problem contact uh, type we have and this example is coupled analysis of deformation of dyes and material similar to the example we, we had in previous slide but okay in this case we have to uh, mesh the dyes because in this simulation we are trying to we are trying to simulate the wear behavior wear behavior of dye so if you want to see if you want to model the wear behavior of dye so you need the temperature distribution you should be able to predict the stress and many and uh, i can say you you an strain so you you should have the state variables and using those predicted state variables and using a mathematical model you can predict the wear here so in this case this problem should be solved uh, with a coupled analysis. It means that you should mesh the workpiece and you should mesh the die. And uh, it's a big, a big uh, discretization you have in your problem, and of course your simulation goes slow because of the uh, high number of elements in your simulation. Okay, so we talked about non-linearity and now it, it seems that in most of problems, in most of problems we have non-linearity. So how we can treat it, how we can solve the problem. The non-linearity and non-steady process are the reason why the ending state cannot be calculated directly from the starting state. Okay, for example, in this rolling process, this is the starting uh, state and this is the final state. However, you cannot uh, model this process just using the initial state and final state. Yeah, in analytical methods, for example, in upper one methods, in some analytical methods, we use this approach but uh, you should notice that the result will not be so accurate for example if you want to calculate the forging force uh, just uh, based on the initial and the final shape of the workpiece you can obtain something but it's not accurate 
that's why for example with upper one method so that's why we call it upper one method and upper one method it means that you will overestimate the load okay so this is not acceptable so what what we do in simulation is the second animation the second figure you can see here so we start to simulate from the beginning to the end and uh, the step by step when time passes then rolling process proceeds and the process is simulated in this way okay so now here we have time time is included in the problem so how we can treat the time the effect of time in simulation okay we talked about the discretization on geometry last last week in last session and this mesh this meshing system could help us to solve the problem in numerical way and now we use almost the same approach but this time the discretization of time okay what does it mean discretization of time it means that we break down our process the total time into the small time intervals and, and you, as you can see here this is the initial form at the time time of zero and then by passing the time the formation is applied and the process proceeds in this way so up to now we can conclude that we need uh, discretization of time we need that uh, to because without discretization of time we cannot solve our problem so how we can discretize, discretize the time we have two approach to discretize and we have two methods for integration of time which are implicit and explicit methods from now on we will talk about these two different approaches the advantages and disadvantages and then we'll compare it compare them okay let's uh, talk about the implicit method for a simple example again which is the uh, calculating the deform the elongation of a spring when you apply a force on a, a spring okay here of course we have we have a non-linear problem because this stiffness of the spring is not linear you can see here it's at the beginning it's linear but later it's not linear so our problem is now linear so if you start from the, this point u0 which is the problem is not linear anymore and then we apply the load delta p here and uh, if we, if if we assume the behavior linear up to here which is ua then your calculation your calculated force is here but the real force the real force is this so uh, we can calculate this ra value which is we, which we call it the residuum value in this way and i can say that this uh, residuum value is the error value the error between the reality and between your model at this step so if this value this ra value is not too big is not too big it, it depends on uh, your definition in your simulation uh, so if it's, it's, it's smaller than some value which you can uh, define it in your simulation then uh, your solution is converged your solution is converged so you can go to another step but if it's it's bigger than the critical value you have defined then your solution is not converged if your solution is not converged then in implicit method we should break down this 
increment to smaller increments and repeat this kind of calculation as you can see here and in this way you can decrease the error between the uh, predicted and value or the calculated value and the reality and then the second increment for example here again the same approach which is the implicit approach okay that was the implicit approach so now let's talk about the explicit FEM method or explicit approach in uh, FEM uh, models and simulations in the case of explicit method uh, okay first uh, I have to say that we usually use the explicit met models or explicit methods uh, for the dynamic problems if you have deformation which is applied in a very short time for example a crash test or as an example this is a, a, a kind of test um, a drop test it's a drop test to obtain some properties of material and uh, in this in this way you can uh, measure the damping energy for this material so it's this part falls down with high speed so this kind of drop test if you want to simulate of course you should use the explicit method but if your deformation is applied much more slowly for example in rolling in forging with, with the lower speed not with, with a very high speed usually this kind of process are not categorized in high speed deforming process then in that kind of process we use the implicit method but in dynamic uh, systems with a high def uh, rate of deformation we use the explicit integration of time so in the case of explicit we have two additional terms because this is the simple form of equation we talked about it many times and this is the stiffness but here in the case of explicit you have two more terms here which this one is related to the acceleration and this Vn is the velocity and this KUN is the uh, stiffness matrix we talked about it before so this this C value is the matrix of damping and M value is the matrix of mass here okay let's check that how uh, this explicit integration brings non-linearity to the problem in the explicit FEM the system of equation decomposes into a system of linear equation that can be solved explicitly explicitly so you can solve the problem easier in the case of explicit approach but the problem is that the mechanical balance is not checked at the end of each step each time step so there is no guarantee that the, the solution you obtained at the end of each step is uh, very correct so I can say that in explicit form we sacrifices the accuracy to solve the problem faster the mathematical model is conditionally stable and convergence can be guaranteed it means that you you uh, the definitely you can obtain the uh, converged solution but if you use the small time step your time step should be very small in the case of explicit uh, simulation and what okay we define the criteria here 
uh, this is the time step and we can calculate it in this way so if you want to obtain the delta t which we call it uh, the current time step this is another terminology for this here l is the characteristic of element lens it's the element less lens and cl is the sonic velocity for the considered material it's the velocity of the sound in the material we are simulating so this is an example for example if you assume the element size in the scale of millimeter I mean, for example one millimeter in a steel and in a steel the sonic velocity is 5000 meter per second so with these values this delta t the maximum of this delta t or your time step will be 10 to minus 6 second because okay we have 1000 here and this one millimeter you should convert it into meter then it becomes 10 to minus 6 the scale of your time step so if you choose the time step in this scale or smaller then you can rely on your uh, result and the converg convergence of your solution will be guaranteed but if you choose bigger time step bigger than this value then maybe your solution will not converge okay So let's see how the nonlinearity comes to the problem when you use the explicit integration of time. This is the general form of the equation we talked about it. And in the case of M and C, you can see we have no nonlinearity with respect to time here and here. But for the k, we have nonlinearity here with respect to the time or delta t. So all nonlinearity brings to the problem with k in this equation. And uh, furthermore, we have to make this assumption to solve the problem. The mass of an element is concentrated in its node. That's why the matrix becomes a diagonal matrix. So we use, we assume the concentrated mass on the nodes in, 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 uh, to solve, in solving our problem in the case of explicit simulation. And you know, when the matrix becomes diagonal matrix, we talked about it last week, then obtaining the inverse a matrix and solving the problem becomes much more simple that's why in, ex if in explicit form you can solve the equations much more easier and the second assumption is that it's assumed that damping matrix behaves proportional to the matrix of mass so this is the mathematical form of the explicit integration of time and the way that nonlinearity comes to the problem through the time. But we, we have two tricks in numerical simulation. In the case of uh, explicit integration, one is mass scaling, another is, is the scaling of the process time. These two kind of scaling you can use if you uh, can if you simulate your problem in explicit form. Uh, usually in the Abacus software you can use this option because in Abacus you can uh, do the you can perform the explicit and implicit uh, simulation both. In the case of explicit simulation, you can define the mass scaling or the scaling of process time.
Okay, what does it mean the mass scaling? The maximum time step is coupled to the density of the body. So, uh, the, prop the proportionality is given by the sonic velocity. To enlarge the time step, the density of the body is increased. It means that we assume a higher density for the material. Okay, however, you know, it's, it's a kind of... It's, it's, uh, uh, makes our simulation far from reality and uh, the, odd, the second trick is scaling the process time the total number of time incre increments is given by the quotient of total process time and the time step length so if you choose a smaller process time then the number of increment can be reduced this is another trick that you can use in explicit integration or expl explicit uh, simulations I can say that both these methods uh, are uh, similar then the, the result will be same but in some cases oh, uh, for example in the case of time dependent material behavior uh, this applying mass scaling and scaling the process of the process time gives different answers for your simulation so you should notice that if you have a time dependent material properties then you should choose the correct uh, scaling uh, method as i said these methods both methods change the physical system it's uh, I can say that it's what you are simulating is not very similar to reality so it's a kind of virtual problem that you are simulating and sometimes due to this scaling uh, the reality might not, might not be represented by the simulation the your prediction may be far from the reality so these are the uh, barriers we have in the case of explicit uh, integration and uh, these these methods are in some cases are practical you can use it but in some cases uh, brings inaccuracy to your problem so you should choose the correct uh, simulation method uh, i can say Okay, and about this uh, kinetic and inter in internal energy, uh, we will talk about it in uh, another slide. It's a uh, typical criterion for a uh, quasi-static problem. So the ratio should be less than 5%. So if it's less than 5%, then the, your problem is quasi-static. But if, if it's more than 5%, then you have a dynamic problem. So let's summarize the difference between the implicit and explicit analyzers in the case of implicit FEM analyzers. We have a method of solving to obtain the un un unknowns, for example, X here, uh, through the matrix inversion or equivalent process. This is known as an implicit analysis when the problem is non-linear the solution is obtained in a number of steps and the solution for the current step is based on the solution from the previous step this is what we do in implicit uh, method as we talked it in at the beginning of this topic for a large model inverting a matrix is highly expensive it expensive it means that it's not easy and it takes time for computer to obtain the uh, invert matrix and of course it requires advanced irritative solvers and the solvers should calculate uh, many times to obtain the invert matrix but uh, 
in the case of imp implicit method, the solutions are unconditionally stable. So anyway, your solution is stable and you could use the bigger time steps in, your, in the case of implicit, of course, in compared to the explicit method. But in the case of implicit, it's very time consuming and uh, uh, if you want to solve a dynamic or nonlinear problem using an implicit method. So as I said before, for the, in the case of dynamic problem, there is no way to use uh, uh, explicit FEM analysis. In explicit FEM analysis, The aim is to solve the acceleration. So here it's like if you the unknown unknown is x in the case of implicit, in the case of explicit, we want to obtain the x bond, which is it's is the second derivation of displacement. So in most cases the mass matrix is considered as a lump or and thus a diagonal matrix. So, as I said, we assume the mass concentrated on the nodes, so the matrix becomes diagonal. So, we can solve it very easy compared to the implicit. So, because of this becoming diagonal matrix, inversion of matrix becomes straightforward and we can simply solve it. And uh, in this case, the calculation, the scheme is not unconditionally sta sta stable compared because here your solution is unconditionally stable. In any way, your solution is stable in the case of implicit, but in the case of explicit, it's not unconditionally stable. But uh, if you want to make it stable, you should make the time step smaller smaller than a critical value which is which is called current time step and uh, we I explained that how we can calculate that value okay so in this way we can summarize the advantages and disadvantages of implicit and explicit FEM analysis however I have another slide which briefly talks about the advantage and disadvantages of these two methods. So here we compare these two methods from the effectiveness point of view. This, okay, here we have the effectiveness and here the static problem and highly dynamic problem. So it means that if you have a static problem, the implicit method is a good method to simulate. If you have a highly dynamic problem, then of course explicit method is the way you should choose to simulate. But in the middle, if you have a structural dynamics, which is, is something between the static or highly dynamic problem, of course you can use the implicit or explicit method both. It depends on your uh, problem and this figure is comparing the CPU time or calculation time uh, versus number of degrees of freedom. So let's see if we increase the number of degrees of freedom, uh, how would be the CPU time or calculation time for these two different approaches or methods. Okay, number of degrees of freedom in another word it's the number of elements because if you increase the number of elements or if you increase the number of nodes in your simulation then the number of degrees of freedom increases so this figure is showing that in the case of implicit uh, FEM uh, calculation or FEM simulation at the beginning by increasing the number of nodes the CPU time that does not increase too much, but after a well, you know, but after that it increased 
with a high with a sharp rate but in the case of explicit i can say that it's a kind of linear behavior by increasing the number of degree or number of nodes the cpu time is increasing but yeah not uh, with the same rate i can say so and these two examples are uh, you, uh, using the explicit and uh, examples of using explicit and implicit uh, FEM simulation for almost a similar problem, but the thing is that here we have a high speed electromagnetic impact process. So here punch drops very fast. So in this study, uh, which in this I. I brought this example from a paper which is published so they use the explicit method for simulation but uh, in this case it's the uh, uh, Nakazima form formability test we talked about this in fundamental of uh, metal forming last semester so in this case the deformation rate is not the uh, is not too high so implicit uh, method is used for this simulation okay nice that we have a question so so i understand that still you can hear me and okay why is implicit taking more cpu time for the same num number of degrees of freedom Okay, the reason is that we, we talked about it. Okay, I should go back to slide. The reason is hidden here. So in, in, in implicit uh, f uh, solution, if it's not converged, then the number of uh, uh, time step the number of iteration increases increases to make it converge here okay here it's like in like three for example three iteration but uh, in reality maybe much more iteration you need because you need a stable very stable answer here and again for the next step so this this makes uh, the problem more time consuming compared to the explicit method okay clear okay so okay let's uh, summarize the advantages and disadvantages of explicit and implicit methods which are okay basically these are two methods of time discretization in the FEM as I said so in the case of explicit the advantages are for nonlinear problem only linear system of equation have to be solved it means that even your problem is nonlinear you, you can solve the linear uh, problems because the matrix become becomes uh, diagonal okay in, it's in explicit instant is in insensitive towards non-linearity and its instabilities it's not sensitive and uh, very effective for diagonal mass matrix and the scaling of mass or process time okay but there are some disadvantages for explicit method the stability is limited, as I said. Sometimes this scaling of mass or process time can result uh, in dynamic effects. It means that it can uh, make your simulation far from reality. You should take, you should note when you apply such a techniques for uh, mass scaling or process time scaling. And another disadvantage is that numerical error are not easy to estimate especially concerning the calculated stresses but in the case of implicit 
again there are some advantages like larger time step possible in the case of implicit you can choose larger time step however in the case of explicit we say we, we told I told that there is a criterion that the time step should be less than that value else your problem will not converge and uh, it's a stable method if convergence is achieved and effective for a small and linear problem in implicit method is effective for a small and linear problems but there are some disadvantages also implicit analyzers are very time confused con time consuming as we talked about it before for problem with large contact area the time step becomes small because more non linearity becomes to the problem as i as we talked it about as we i talked about the contact and how it affects the problem it means that if for example if you start the simulation a forging simulation at the beginning uh, with a complicated die at the beginning the uh, contact between the material and the die is not big but when the time passes during the deformation the material becomes in contact with the die more and more so the contact area increases and uh, to solve the problem and to s obtain the convergence you should make the time step smaller and smaller and uh, no convergence for, for instabilities so if you have a kind of for example bottling or uh, wrinkling uh, which uh, that are, th these are kind of instabilities then the problem cannot be solved and you will not have a convergence okay let's compare uh, two simulation uh, deep drawing simulation uh, so two different uh, uh, test is simulated here I can say that test is similar but the speed is different the velocity of the die upper die is different here is 10 meter per second that we can we can assume it quasi static in this case so at the end of the formation you can see there is no effect of the dynamic and high speed uh, high speed uh, movement of punch on the deformed material here but if you compare this figure with this one which here the velocity is higher so you can see okay not the material the sheet metal is detached from the die because of higher speed of the punch and the dynamic effects so now you can easily choose that for this kind of problem you should use an implicit FEM but for this kind of problem you should uh, employ the explicit method if you employ the implicit method for this high speed then such effect cannot be simulated can cannot be seen and uh, this graph is comparing the kinetic energy and internal energy if you remember we said that there is a criterion which it should be less than five percent then uh, you can use the implicit if it's more than five percent then explicit here then this graph is showing the value of the kinetic energy and internal energy in two cases of implicit and explicit then you can compare and understand that why this is here explicit method is used and why here implicit method is used and this animation is showing the same process but of course this is for a, a low uh, velocity of die for the first case okay and oh we have another question i now i see the question does element size changes for this method oh, which method I, 
right? because I, I, I here come to in this slide when I'm comparing because I couldn't uh, realize that when when did you write your question? If you if you are talking about these two simulation, no, the the, the number of elements is same. Okay, what's the another question? What's the main difference between the dynamic and static model? Yeah, it it depends. Okay, uh, 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 when your deformation applied with a high rate, it it's categorized in dynamic models. For example, if as I said, it's if it's a drop test or if you are simulating a, a crash test, when the deformation is applied in a short per period of time, it's dynamic. Uh, a deformation model so you should use the explicit form if your deformation is applied with the normal uh, speed of the deformation process like the forging like rolling usually and the other process then mostly the, the deformation process are solved by implicit form implicit model okay and let's go to the next topic, which is the adaptive meshing. We talked about the time, and now we want to talk. We go back to the uh, geometry discretizing, but we do not talk about the mathematical equation anymore. Just we talk about the adaptive meshing system here. It, as an example, you can see here it's a shearing process or. Uh, 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 blanking process and you can see that the meshing system is change is changing during the deformation so the software changes the meshing system during the deformation just keeping it keep it in mind and now we will talk about it that why it happens and why we why the software has such options which we call it adaptive meshing or remeshing in the simulation problems. We have two ways of the description of deformation. One is the Euler. In the case of Euler approach, the material is located in a fixed grid, so the gridding is fixed, and uh, when we have such a displacement, no, deforma no deformation of grid we have. No, the grids are fixed, fixed, or the mesh are fixed. But the problem is that if you use this Euler uh, method, we have no exact representation of the boundary of the area and workpiece. So it means that the Euler method is not appropriate for our case, which we have the deformation. So in this, in our case, in the, the simulation of deformation process, we use the Lagrange method. Usually, Euler method is used for the simulation in liquids, in uh, melt, in CFD simulations. But in the case of metal forming simulation, we use the uh, we describe the deformation using the Lagrange method. In Lagrange method, mesh is attached to the material, as you can see here. The mesh, the mesh, meshing system is attached. So when it rotates, the meshing system also rotates with the material. It's good. In this way, we can define the boundary condition very simple in simple form. But there is an there is a disadvantage for that, which is in the case of large deformation, we have a kind of mesh distortion. And because of this mesh distortion, 
Remeshing is necessary. Okay, let's see and talk about it in more detail. Okay, this is a this is a simple example of offsetting of and with the standard meshing, quadratic meshing, the die comes down and then okay barreling happens and here at the I can say at the almost at the in the middle stage of the deformation you can see this element it's not quadratic anymore it's not square anymore but it's triangle so it means that one of the corners which maybe is here now are in the same line with these two corners and it shows that we have a big distortion here and usually if you have a big distortion then you know that the software solves the problem element by uh, element or node by node so in this case the software cannot solve the problem so how we can treat it okay if you you so you have an option in your simulation which is the remeshing or adaptive meshing if you turn it off then at this stage of simulation your simulation stops and you give some you receive some errors but if you turn the remeshing or adaptive meshing on in your simulation software then the, sim the software treat this height uh, distorted mesh in this way as you can see here it's a kind of uh, it's a new system of meshing replaced this system of meshing is replaced by a new system of meshing so to remove this distortion here you can see that there you have a smaller size of mesh here and the value are mapped all the value nodal value which were obtained here are mapped to this new situation or system of mesh so this is another example shows the uh, riveting process self riveting process and you can see that uh, okay th there is a very um, important point here about the remeshing of course remeshing helps us to be able to proceed and finish the simulation but the, from the point of view of accuracy remeshing is not good why because when you are mapping the, the, the solution the results I can say that when you are mapping the state variables from the uh, before remeshing to the, uh, to the form of material after remeshing so the numerical errors are uh, inevitable so some numerical errors comes to your uh, uh, calculation because of remeshing so if you can solve your problem without remeshing of course uh, from the point of view of accuracy you will obtain a better result however in many cases it's not possible because you will have uh, distorted mesh and then your simulation will stop it of course i can say that it depends on the process and it depends on the uh, s amount of deformation you are applying and the uh, co uh, complexity of your problem okay let's see the effect of remeshing here okay i i'm not sure that you can clearly uh, see the system of remeshing this is okay this is the initial state of course and then when the deformation is applied this system of mesh is before remeshing that is the old mesh but because of distortion here and maybe here then the remeshing happened and the software automatically remesh and create the new meshing system to be able to proceed and finish the simulation 
and this remeshing and adaptive meshing is important uh, from the point of view of defining the contact or detecting the contact surfaces in your simulation in this case you can see okay here you can see better it's without remeshing a simulation without remeshing so because of this uh, highly distorted elements here you can see that the dye is penetrated in the material but when the remeshing happens and you have the mesh with smaller size then the dye and the material are fitting well so this is an example of uh, the advantage of using remeshing and the, the last topic is the contact, contact problem so let's talk about the contact problem and uh, okay this is an example of a stamping process and you can see that here in order to define the contacts well a smaller size of the mesh is given in some areas okay now we, we talk about it that why the software uh, choose this small size of mesh sometimes automatically sometimes you have to apply the mesh uh, manually uh, or locally mesh uh, by yourself it depends on the software the ability of software and the options you turn on or off it during the simulation okay generally in the case that you have a tool here and uh, deformable material then okay before contact we have no problem and when the dye is in contact with material then the boundary condition changes after contact the boundary condition here changes because the force are applied on these nodes so how we can mathematically describe this this is the way we describe the contact and this is the equation which is used so we have a gn value here so if a gn value is bigger than zero we have no contact of course if it's equal to zero it's a perfect contact and if gn is negative then we have penetration that this penetration is not appropriate in the case of our simulation because it affects the boundary condition the situation of the condition of bond, the boundary condition defined on the surface So, in the, for example, in the case of Abacus software, uh, you, uh, if, if you want to define the contact between two, for example, between die and workpiece, then you have a slave and master. Uh, usually, uh, we define the die as a master and the deformable part as the slave. In other software, because the, the uh, next week I will compare the different software, but Abacus is a I, th I can say it's the most strong uh, simulator, and uh, why it's most strong because it's much more flexible, so you can simulate many different things uh, uh, with Abacus. However, using uh, Abacus is not simple compared to other software. So because of this generality which we, we have in Abacus uh, so uh, you can define the slave and master by yourself if you want but in the other uh, commercial the simulator for deform deformation process because you define the die and workpiece it automatically decides about which is a slave which is master by itself and uh, so uh, okay this is not this is correct situation because we have no penetration I can say that the dye is not penetrated 
in the material but in the case of uh, defining a wrong con contact condition then the dye is penetrating material or vice versa in this way so this is not suitable for us and uh, again it's talking about the ideal condition of the contact and uh, when we when you have a small overcloser here it's about the previous slide I can say so uh, finally what the conclusion is that you should define the contact surfaces well especially if you are using the abacus software in other software it's defined automatically but in the case of abacus you should uh, uh, correctly define what is the master what is the slave and uh, this uh, and the size and the element size on the surface sometimes you have to apply some local mesh size like here some local mesh size to apply the, uh, the contact situation perfectly on the uh, material during the deformation so in some cases you need some local uh, meshing or in some software in some software there are some automatic option which make this remeshing or uh, uh, local fine meshing automatically in the case of contact we have an another important topic which is friction so how we can model the friction we know that we have we can the, basically we can model in the Coulomb equation which is familiar for you in Coulomb friction the amount of friction is increasing when the normal stress is increased and the other friction is the shear friction or this friction factor which assume that this value is constant however we can define a hybrid condition which is the red line here and it means in hybrid uh, friction model at the initial stages the friction increases to some value but after that by increasing the normal stress the friction value does not increase that much it's a kind of okay hybrid model hybrid model you can use and uh, Regardless of these two models, even if you want to consider the Coulomb friction, only Coulomb friction in your model, uh, okay, in many simulations, we give the constant value for the Coulomb friction. However, in reality, it's not a constant value. And if I explain, you can understand easily. Okay, imagine that, uh, okay, this is the function. It shows that the friction coefficient is a function of pressure applied is a function of temperature and it could be the function of a strain so it means that even changing temperature changes the friction condition and uh, the, the value of a strain applied it affects the friction and of course the applied force it's clear applied force it's we can see here in this uh, in these uh, figures but in the case of temperature and strain you should note that even these two state variables can affect the Coulomb friction so it's a kind of big it's a big non-linearity usually here so as an example you can see here if you want to simulate a very uh, accurate condition of deformation then uh, you can see that the value of Coulomb friction are different for example here is 0 0.1 and then it's increased to 0 0.5 because here like higher strain is applied and of course it's the function of temperature condition so friction uh, seems very simple but 
in the reality, it's very complicated to model. Uh, if you want to obtain a good result in a very uh, accurate model, it's not easy to model the friction condition. Okay. And uh, yeah, this is about the tangential contact. Uh, a component. No, nothing to add on this slide. It was almost clear and talked about it. So, uh, this slide compares two methods of the, the Lagrange method and the uh, penalty method. So, we have four again for treating the uh, uh, so, so obtaining the solution on the surface between the material and the tool we have two different methods which uh, this uh, one is the Lagrange method another is the penalty method so now we want to compare In if you use the Lagrange method to uh, define the boundary condition and on, on the surface then the stiffness matrix is enlarged as you can see here and the band structure of the stiffness matrix is lost. You can see it's not the a, a diagonal matrix anymore because you have some value here and non non zero components here and here. So it's not a diagonal matrix anymore. And uh, a constant boundary condition fulfilled exactly in the case of if you apply the boundary condition using the Lagrange method but if you use the penalty method okay size of the stiffness matrix remains constant still because it has no change same after applying the penalty method uh, but uh, condition of a stiffness matrix becomes worse and the solution lose the precision and constant boundary condition only fulfilled by approximation. So the penalty method is, is not an accurate way of solution for the boundary condition. At you know the name shows that you you define the penalty value. That uh, okay, this penalty value shows that some in this model some amount of error is acceptable. So it means that the accuracy is degraded. In penalty method. However, it brings some uh, simplicity in the calculation. Okay, and this was the last slide. So, if we want to summarize what we have talked about it today, and in these two sessions, okay, we talked, we introduced the finite element method, and we talked, we s spoke about the what is the finite element method and then uh, we talked about the element discretization that we needed in finite element method and today we started with talking about uh, time discretization and then we explained about adaptive meshing what is adaptive meshing and what is remeshing and why we, we need remeshing and adaptive meshing in simulation and finally, we talked about the contact problems, how we can treat the contacts in simulations and uh, what features you should uh, consider when you defining the contact problems. So I close the uh, session here, but uh, I'm ready to answer your question if there is any question.